of control of, of a territory across the country and Jibo was still in the hands of the government but surrounded by this armed group. And Jibo uh, had the awful privilege of 300,000 internally displaced people coming to that town of 90,000, hugely outnumbering local people in a situation where no supplies could get in and no food had arrived in this town when I visited it for a good six or seven weeks. The most recent convoy had been attacked and burned out on the road into Jibo. And the women were telling me of what their reaction was and they had of course run out of food. There was no food to be found. And they were feeding their children leaves and salt, as they said to me, leaves and salt. And tragically, the leaves were now running out as well. And these women had to go across the line of conflict by night to find leaves in places where they may still exist. And they did so with that courage that we know so well and that persistence that we see so clearly everywhere that we have the privilege of working. They risked their lives each time they did it and many lost their lives in the process. And I want to add one really poignant moment from that visit uh, was, was I was meeting then the people from the local community, the 90,000 who were hosting and providing their all to their unexpected visitors. And there was a young man, probably about 18 or 19, he was there representing youth, in fact, in this small, small meeting. And he could hardly speak. He suddenly broke down in telling us about the situation and he as he was doing so it was because as he said I want to speak of the extraordinary uh, situation of my friends who have no food who spend the day hoping and looking for food and he stopped speaking he couldn't speak anymore and again these are the people who are the first responders to need and displacement and are proud people of that extraordinary continent a continent in that Sahel region, hard hit by the climate crisis, the Sahel is heating up at one and a half times the pace of the global average. And they have to, these people endure the conflict, the drought, and floods. And that has wiped out the incomes of millions in that wonderful country. The fate of that young man and of those women and their children and their families is why we're here today. The Global Humanitarian Overview, the GHO, is our annual humanitarian appeal that goes some way to showing people living on the sharpest edge of suffering that we, that, to ensure that we will stand by them in a year to come of solidarity and do our part to help. The message of this year's GHO, as we know, is stark. This time last year, 274 million people needed humanitarian assistance. That was, we were in this room, that was already a 17% increase from the previous year. And for 2023, that number has gone up again, bringing the number of people in need across the globe to 339 million, and a figure which is almost unreadable. That's larger than the population of the United States. It means one in every 23 people on the planet need emergency assistance to survive. And behind these figures lie some very disturbing trends. Hunger levels have grown year on year for the past four years, for many reasons we constantly debate. Next year, 222 million people, a fairly exact figure, will not know when or even if they will eat another meal. Nearly one million people will be at risk of starvation, the final uh, gateway of that process, due to catastrophic levels of hunger in Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Haiti, Somalia, South Sudan, and Yemen. The number of people displaced continues its steady rise, reaching in 2023, we expect 103 million, a new record. Global public health trends are rocky, with a rise in mortality from pandemics and epidemics like cholera and COVID-19. 
Infant vaccine coverage has experienced its biggest drop in 30 years, which could prove disastrous to future generations. And in the discussion I had with the leaders of Médecins Sans Frontières two days ago, they spoke of the extraordinary uh, spread of cholera. Just pick one terrible scourge, the scourge, of course, that visits children first, the spread of cholera to 30 countries, uh, an increase of about a half on the average. And this was largely, as they say, as a result of the pandemic, which focused medical and health uh, efforts on one disease and let another through. The pandemic itself also swerved us off track to end extreme poverty. We were on track, we thought, to end extreme poverty by 2030. We haven't yet recovered from that swerve. And these trends also mean that gender parity, as I'm sure we will hear from Natalia, is, is also going off the rails. As women and children are hardest hit by poverty and hunger, hardest hit by the sort of suffering that I was just describing, and we estimate that it will now take four generations to achieve global gender parity, which is a vicious prospect for women and girls across the world. We're familiar with the principal drivers of these trends. Conflict, conflict, instability and violence that grind on for years without any let up, such as in Syria or Yemen, where I, where I have worked, and fresh conflicts. This year, the world reeled as war was waged in Ukraine, causing the deaths of tens of thousands of people, wiping out electricity and water supplies, destroying hospitals, schools, and homes, and triggering one of the world's worst displacement crises since the Second World War. Second, the conflict emergency, which is claiming the lives of the most vulnerable, which is encouraging cries for climate justice and which is claiming the lives of the most vulnerable, outpacing the effort of the world's uh, leaders and investors and donors and funders to stem it. It is indeed a painful injustice that the countries that have contributed the least to this crisis are among the most at risk. The Horn of Africa, for example, is enduring a fifth successive failed rainy season. Record flooding, as we've all seen, has submerged entire villages and harvests in Nigeria and Pakistan, of course. These facts alone should be enough to spur us into action, but sadly we're not there yet. Third, the world still experiences the pandemic's effects, which caused economic instability, disrupted markets, disrupted supply chains, increased poverty. So it's hardly a surprise that the issue that we're here today to look at, the humanitarian response system, is being tested to its limits. I, like I'm sure all others here, and I'm sure all others here, still retain hope, because the higher the pressure, the more determined I think we all are to step up the challenge and to do that in solidarity to those people in Jibo who are simply an example of something we see across the globe. This GHO is the most comprehensive assessment of global humanitarian needs. It's not the only one. It's based on rigorous analysis that puts people in need at the center of its planning. It's also an appeal to donors here present, of course, to support the response to hunger, disease, gender-based violence, and economic collapse in crises worldwide. This year, we received $24 billion in funding. That's 47% of our goal for this year. And though it fell far short of what was needed, the 40-odd billion dollars that we began the year with, of 2022, humanitarian agencies, many here present, use this funding to reach over 145 million people, near to 80% of our target at some time with some assistance. And with this aid, I believe we, provided, I believe we can claim that we provided increasing value for money. One example of this is that while the, the number of people in need has more than doubled in five years, funding requirement more than doubled in five years, the numbers of people in need, the funding asked to meet those needs has gone up only by one and a half times. With the funding we received in 2022, we provided 
food assistance to 157 million people, aid and protection to displaced people in 46 countries, emergency health care to more than 40 million people in the first half of the year. In Afghanistan, one of the worst places in the world in this sense, humanitarians scaled up to reach more than 27 million people with some kind of assistance, challenging the record of Yemen for the highest number of people in the population needing humanitarian assistance. In the Horn, we reach millions with nutrition treatment and other support. And in, in Ukraine, we together implemented the largest humanitarian cash assistance program in history. By this year's end, we will, thanks to your generosity, have transferred $1.7 billion to more than 6 million people, an extraordinary effort built up from almost zero, as we know, in that country. As conflict continued to wield suffering, for example, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, country I grew up in, humanitarians provided food, shelter, medicine, and other essentials to 5 million people. And in Yemen, as the impact of the conflict continued to destroy lives, agencies assisted an average of 10.6 million people, thanks to your generosity and others, each month. Pooled funds, as many of you uh, provide uh, investment and support to them, played an important role, a crucial lifeline, because they can deliver money quickly and they can deliver it to the front lines. And they provided $1.7 billion uh, for their programming priority. I think we also try to make progress in our policies, in our approach. By acting early, ahead of crisis, through anticipatory action, and I thank Germany for their leadership in this particular issue, we made resources more efficient in dozens of countries, including Ethiopia, Nepal, Somalia, South Sudan, Bangladesh, and we need to roll it out to others in the year to come. We continue to try harder to be better at listening to people and to adapt what we do to what they tell us they want us to do. A huge priority for us as we go into next year. A huge issue for the humanitarian community that we have been specifically looking at together this week. How do we do that better? And that is about empowering local response. Local and national organizations are now included in at least 80% of humanitarian country teams and receive more than a third of country-based pool funds. We've tried harder, too, with women's organizations. There's still a long way to go. In Afghanistan, the Afghan Women's Advisory Group now advises the humanitarian country team. It took some time, but I think, thank God we got there. In Kenya, a network of women-led organizations guide the drought response. Humanitarian diplomacy is a term that means different things to different people, as I realized in these past months. But there is a good example in front of us. After months of negotiation with the governments of Russia and Ukraine, and aided and led and supported by the government of Turkey in different roles, there was that landmark agreement for the passage of grain and other foodstuffs through the Black Sea and the removal of impediments to Russian exports. That helps, but it's also beyond its help. It's an indication that people, even enemies, can come together in war to meet the needs of others and to do the right thing, which is what this GHO is all about. This next year, we're ambitious again hopeful, aspiring, needy. Ten country programs have needs above $1 billion for the year. That's a new, a, new, a new list. They include Afghanistan, the DRC I've mentioned, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Somalia, South Sudan, Sudan, Syria, Ukraine, and Yemen. The requirements have grown in many countries. They include Haiti. And I want to say one thing about Haiti, which is so, so, so disturbing. I'm sure Natalia has been hearing this. The reports of gender-based violence in Haiti are quite, quite, quite out of this world. 
almost impossible to read and certainly impossible to believe. And that's separate from and feeding into the threatened cholera outbreak to that benighted country. Haiti must be very close to our top priority. Lebanon, where financial collapse has caused needs to, to soar and which is now a firm partner in humanitarian assistance, which it proudly wasn't for so many years. Afghanistan, where drought and a crackdown by the Taliban on women's rights from February onwards has left more than 28 million people in need. The 2023 GHO outlines how we can support 230 million people of the most vulnerable people in 69 countries. And to, to, to be clear, the difference between that and the 339 million that I mentioned at the outset is because their needs are also met by whom? By host communities, by host governments, by the Red Cross movement, by MSF, by other organizations. Our appeal is obviously a very signal one, but there are others. There are other partners in this endeavor. We require nothing less than 51 and a half billion dollars. Quite a lot of money. I hope you'll help us make it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin Griffith's very sobering assessment. Um, not the year we expected to be starting when we met this time last year, but events, events have intervened again. Um, we heard that um, women are the first to go hungry. We have for you today an all-woman panel to unpick this appeal, look at the needs and where we can perhaps improve, where we can target. I'm not going to read everybody's name out because they are in front of you. Two guests will be joining us virtually um, just because we are running a bit late and you want to hear from them rather than me. So we are <laughs> excuse me, um, going to start with... Um, Madame Virginie Barcoua, Minister of Humanitarian Action, Solidarity and National Reconciliation, Central African Republic. And um, Madame, votre langue maternelle est française. Madame, your mother tongue is French. And we're here in Geneva. Microphone, please, for the speaker. Microphone for the distinguished speaker, please. The interpreter is not here for the speaker because the speaker's microphone is not on. The speaker's microphone is not on. We cannot the interpret. Merci. Ça va être un Thank you. It'll be difficult to sum up everything in four minutes, but I'll do my ba best in summarizing everything, particularly with respect to women. First and foremost, I'd like to thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to raise the issue of the Central African Republic and place it on the international agenda. Thank you also to all of the partners who fin finance the humanitarian response plan of the CAR, which stands at 80 percent for two successive years. I'd like to thank you for your generosity. Just to come back to another very relevant issue, I must acknowledge that in spite of successive efforts imposed by the, or challenges by the COVID-19 and rainfall and drought have con contributed to the conflict in Ukraine. However, the government has continued to work in a consulted, uh, coordinated fashion with technical and financial resources in order to respond to all crises including food insecurity. An example of implementation of intersectoral coordination whereby we discuss with our various partners in order to take joint decisions to attain a better result. The government has provided its support to the drafting and implementation of the Humanitarian Response Plan, which focuses on the critical needs assessed by the government and all humanitarian stakeholders who play a role in CAR, and I'd like to commend their efforts, their multifaceted efforts, with respect to food insecurity, which is on the rise. Over the half of the 
the first half of 2022, the government, uh, supported by the WHO and WFP, provided specific food with uh, agricultural inputs and have set up social security networks. During the global forum, the government is committed to combating food insecurity. This is its main battlefield and has placed it as a priority amongst government actions. Lastly, as to the protection of women and girls, the government is working with uh, specialized agencies, particularly uh, a number of agencies, to meet the needs of these vulnerable groups, despite the major disturbances in supply chains and planning services. Food aid is provided within the context of inequitable gender relations where men hold a monopoly over decisions without forgetting the management of household resources. Play, women play a very low, uh, weak role when it comes to decision making, the management of land, income and the management of harvests. All of this places women in a precarious situation which is extreme. It places them in a risk, at risk of dependence. Most women in the CAR are raped by uh, armed groups operating. Given the role that they play in the family, the well-being of women is key to food security and the nutritional well-being of households. The crisis and fragile context are at the root of uh, poor access to sexual and reproductive health services, which is of high quality. Lastly, this contributes to the rise in the number of maternal deaths, standing at 60% during times of crises. However, during conflict, natural disasters and other emergency situations, uh, needs related to sexual and reproductive health are neglected, whereas they are quite significant. That is why I would advocate so that uh, humanitarian aid can meet the specific needs of women and girls when it comes to sexual and reproductive health. That's what I wanted to say very briefly, because we don't have a lot of time. But uh, that's what I wanted to say about displacement. Perhaps I'll have uh, time to conclude on displacement. Will I have time to conclude my presentation on displacement at a later stage? OK, I'll do it now. With respect to the important changes you would like to see, that was part of your question. Very specifically, the desire of the government is that in 2023, that there are no people who are displaced. We, our most uh, ardent wish is to put an end to the forced displacement of the population by 2023 by seeking sustainable solutions so that we can contribute to the peace consolidation in the CAR. I would like to reassert the government's commitment to support the voluntary return and integration of the population at their place of usual residence in safety and dignity with support from the UNHCR, the UNDP, as well as other partners as co-chairs of the Working Group on Sustainable Solutions. I would like to take this opportunity to launch an appeal for mobilization of all stakeholders involved in the platform Sustainable uh, Solutions in CAR, which was launched last April in Ayunde. I would also like to ask for flexibility in terms of funding. This will make it possible to cover the humanitarian responses needed because crises vary in the country. And when there's no flexibility, it's very difficult for us to save lives. And regrettably, the crisis has now lasted 10 years. For 10 years, families are living in uh, displaced sites, as well as uh, the changes in climate, the heat and the rain. Uh, this has affected these people. It makes things very difficult for them. It will be very difficult for children to grow up in those situations. That is why I would like to take this opportunity from this rostrum to launch an appeal to you, partners in a room who've been with us from the outset. Uh, we recognize true friends in times of need. You've been here, and I hope you will continue to be with us in the coming days and months to continue to save lives and to give opportunities to these people who are there 
in that situation. They haven't asked for this, but they want to move towards uh, development. I'd like to thank you, and I'd like to thank you for your questions. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, uh, Minister. Thank you very much indeed, Minister Baikua. We're going to go to one of our virtual uh, guests now. This is Ms. Mimidou Achakpa. She is of the Feminist Humanitarian Network National Coordinator of the Women in Humanitarian Response in Nigeria Initiative Network. I hope she's there. Uh -huh. Yes, I'm here. Ah, good. Excellent. Hello, hello. Good to see you. <coughs> so, um, as we know, the theme of today's panel is putting people first. And we often think of the local and national NGOs as being really close to the people who need support and really accountable to them. And Ms. Achakpa, your network has more than 100 civil society organizations. So what we're interested in hearing is, how does that actually work? How does accountability work? What does it mean to your members, what does it mean putting people front and centre in the humanitarian response in practice? The floor is yours and you too have four minutes. Okay. Um, thank you so um, very much. Um, it is my pleasure to be here today and share the Feminist Humanitarian Network's perspectives on accountability to affected um, people. For us as a global feminist humanitarian network, Defining accountability to affected people starts by always bearing in mind that people behind the P of that, that behind the P of people, there are individual women, girls, men, boys, people of different ages, background, different gender identities, and characteristics. So the first expectation of AAP systems is that they have to be gender age, disability, and diversity responsive to be effective. Accountability to affected people means recognizing and supporting these different people's own response efforts and their critical frontline humanitarian action and leadership. Yet, crisis affected people's efforts, especially women led, women, when led by women, continue to be ignored by the wider humanitarian system. Whether they belong to the women in humanitarian response in Nigeria Initiative Network, which I coordinate, or the Feminist Humanitarian Network across the Global South. Our members share the same challenges. Procedures to accessing funding are heavy and bureaucratic. Projects are short-term and funding does not cover our costs, making it impossible to retain staff and develop our systems to grow. We face language barriers struggle with dependence on digital tools in remote areas with limited connectivity, to name just but a few. We as women-led organizations work tirelessly to respond to, prepare for, and recover from crisis. We respond to gender-based violence when this issue falls off the agenda, as it is so often does, especially in a crisis. Just the moment when it inevitably increases, we ensure women and girls have access to health services, to shelters, and to helplines. We are among the first to act, and we ensure nobody is left behind. We implement our responses based on long-term relationships built on trust between community members. We are those community members, and we, need, we know what we need. And yet, our voices are not sought out or listened to. And we have to scramble for every um, small amount of money that we can allocate to our work. Many women-led and women's rights organizations representing affected people fund work from their own pockets to ensure that their communities have the specific support they need in an emergency. I can cite examples of that because during the COVID, uh, the lockdown in Nigeria, we mobilized women and we did quite a lot. We raised money and we did uh, quite a lot. Humanitarian action must be transformational and leave no one behind. It must prioritize achieving gender justice by recognizing and resourcing women's rights and feminist organizations on the front lines of crisis and following our leadership, being accountable to us. Significant challenges currently facing AAP strategies and mechanisms will be overcome. AAP also 
also means preventing and responding to sexual harassment, exploitation, and abuse. As members of affected communities, we are best placed to contribute to the design of PCR prevention and response strategies to women and girls, friendly and accessible complaints, feedback and reporting mechanisms. Currently, these systems remain inaccessible and underutilized, while share risk increase due to growing unmet needs. More resources are critically required to ensure that those who are affected by crisis have the power and the agency to respond to this crisis on our terms. I cannot say it enough. Being accountable to affected communities means hearing our voices, following our leadership, and resourcing our work. It is critical. Right now, to achieve food security in the face of crisis in Nigeria, we are calling on humanitarian actors that hold power in the system to mainstream community and human-centered approaches, leverage local expertise, including existing Nigerian humanitarian and development networks, and ensure indigenous knowledge systems are integral to building community and systemic resilience. This can't be done if we, organizations representing affect affected communities, are not sitting alongside those at the head of the decision-making table. How can humanitarian actors be accountable to affected communities if we are not at the table, if we are often not even participants in the conversation? It is only through collaborative action and a shifting of power to affected communities in humanitarian response that we can truly be accountable to them. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mimidu Achakpa. We're going to hear next from Dr. Natalia Kanem. She's Executive Director of the UN Population Fund. Natalia, quite a lot of frustration I heard there from Mimidu um, Achakpa. She said that uh, women led by women continue to be ignored. She said you can't have accountability if you don't listen to us. So I think we'd, we'd quite like to hear UNFPA's experience with regards to accountability. How do you listen? How do you take advice? And I know you also particularly want to focus in on the case of food insecurity. So your answer, please, again, four minutes. Thanks very much, Excellencies, the Emergency Relief Chief, Madame Ministra, distinguished panelists and, and, uh, and delegates. Just a couple of weeks ago in Somalia, in meeting women and children at a uh, camp for internally displaced people near the border with Ethiopia, I understood that many had walked for days and weeks across a parched, barren landscape in search of food, in search of water, and in search of safety with conflict and hunger causing their distress. They spoke about the hardships. They spoke about the dangers. They shared really heart-rending stories about violence of trauma. And the women told me that they need increased support and they need it urgently. So yes, I am very concerned, as we all must be, that already high rates of maternal mortality could soar even higher if pregnant women don't have access to the type of life-saving health care that you need in these circumstances. And I'm also highly concerned about the rising incidence of gender-based violence. And as humanitarian crises and in food insecurity escalate worldwide, it's women and girls again and again who pay the unacceptable price. Of the more than 103 million people forcibly displaced from their homes, whether it's persecution, war, violence, natural disaster, human rights violations follow, and the vast majority always are who? Women and children. So today what we have is the converging challenges of climate change, of rising food insecurity, armed conflict, and now the economic downturn, which is deepening the protection crisis for women and girls. And the data are bearing this out. 
And while gender-based violence risks and incidents are rising, humanitarian funding for GBV prevention and response remains very low. It totals about just 12% of what's required for action on the ground. The type of action that we've heard eloquently from Madame La Ministra and from the Nigerian network. So I would say that we do need to ensure that sexual and reproductive health services and protection from gender-based violence become integral to every humanitarian response. And we've had big support from our chief on that. These services are not luxuries. What they do spells the difference between life and death for women and girls and for pregnant women, for breastfeeding uh, women, some of whom are actually adolescent girls. Food insecurity risks are higher. And during pregnancy, if you have a poor diet, if you're lacking in key nutrients, this leads to anemia, to preeclampsia, blood pressure issues, hemorrhage, and yes, maternal death. Now, malnutrition is also linked to stillbirth, to low birth weight, to wasting and developmental delays in children. So the urgency I'm underlining, this year alone, UNFPA already has provided life-saving assistance to more than 30 million women, girls, and young people. And this includes services and supplies to prevent maternal and newborn deaths, for family planning, for emergency contraception, and for interventions that prevent and respond to pervasive sexual violence, including the clinical management of rape. And next year, as part of this global humanitarian appeal, UNFPA is requesting 1.2 billion US dollars to provide life-saving services and protection to up to 66 million women, girls, and young people, and that's in 65 countries. And it will include $113 million uh, US dollars to provide services for those affected by drought in the Horn of Africa. So to close, I will say that together, yes, there's a lot more to be done for health, for well-being, for the rights of women and girls in humanitarian crises. And of course, yes, it includes listening to, increasing the support for women leaders. These are people on the front lines, and by the way, includes women health workers who are striving to mitigate the suffering, to expand the hope, and to bring us fundamentally closer to peace and to justice, and that's what takes significant resources. For us at UNFPA, I've pledged and we're following up in listening to survivors, in coordinating and collaborating well, in scaling up our humanitarian operations, and localizing the response. Right now, 38% of UNFPA funds go directly into local hands, and that's women-led organizations, it's youth groups, it's people living with disabilities, and they're identifying the sustainable solutions. They speak the local language, they know the culture, the situation, and what the levers of change are. That's part of accountability. And I must close by saying that gender parity, indeed, is linked to the success of peace, of justice. And this fundamentally is the creation of a lot of this displacement and humanitarian need. So we cannot afford to wait 132 years and four generations for gender parity. None of this is possible without the international community's solidarity, without your generous support. And we certainly are grateful for the governments and the partners and those local groups who are assuring with flexible funding, with timely funding, that we can save those lives and pave a path so women and girls can live in dignity. It's about peace, dignity, and remember women and girls. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, for that timely reminder of what this, this panel is about. We have another virtual panelist now. It's Ms. Diana Janssen. She is Sweden's State Secretary for International Development Cooperation. So bringing perhaps in a way the donor into the conversation here. Um, Ms. Janssen, I assume you are there and ready to join us. I know you've just visited Somalia, which as we heard is on its fifth successive drought. Famine-like con conditions, not technically 
a UN declared famine yet, but pretty much as close as you can get, I think, Mr. Griffiths, you would agree. Um, can you tell us about your experience? What do you think it will take to prevent a full-blown famine there? And what role, because we hear a lot about it when we're talking about uh, uh, aid, what role does flexible funding pay? Um, Ms. Yancer, the floor is yours. You two have four minutes. Thank you very much, and good morning. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to take part in this important event. Uh, the launch being held today is important, given the extremely bleak outlook for global humanitarian needs in the coming year that we have just heard described by the Emergency Relief Coordinator. It is an important moment to show solidarity with those who suffer the most around the world. Last week, um, as you pointed out, I visited Mogadishu, where the urgency of the humanitarian situation is evident. And despite alarm bells of the severe drought already in mid-2021, it was not until June uh, this year that the humanitarian system shifted gear to respond, including through efforts of famine prevention. Now we do not have uh, time to wait. Human lives are at stake, and not only in Somalia. There is also the same uh, dire situation in Afghanistan, Ethiopia, South Sudan, and Yemen. The international community must act swiftly and resolutely to prevent famine, as we did in 2017. Operations need to urgently scale up to save lives and to prevent famine. Flexible funding to the humanitarian system is critical for an effective response. We must also learn from our mistakes and be better to act ahead of a humanitarian crisis before it's coming, becoming a catastrophe. While humanitarian life-saving assistance is important, close cooperation with development and climate actors such as the World Bank, the development banks and IFAD is also vital. Clearly, the drought in Somalia is climate-induced. Extreme weather due to climate change risks soon overtaking conflict as a main cause of hunger. We need to better plan and adapt to the likelihood that climate change will exacerbate this type of extreme weather. We need to build resilience to future shocks and invest in anticipatory action. When I visited Somalia last week, I, I met with um, representatives of NGOs working with resilience uh, measures, and they pointed out that we, since this is the fifth consecutive year, there have been no uh, normal rain. Uh, they pointed out that we could have well have had this situation already two, three years ago. And I, for me, that points out that resilience measures really work, but we need uh, much more of it. And we need to continue to work with resilience measures. Today, the humanitarian system is under extreme pressure. We see a dramatic rise of humanitarian needs around the globe. Together with rising inflation, the cost for humanitarian assistance is higher than ever before. Ultimately, states have the primary responsibility to protect and assist persons in their territories who are affected by disasters, armed conflict or violence. Humanitarian action is designed to complement and support states in fulfilling those responsibilities. It should neither undermine nor supplement state responsibilities. But even so, funding to the humanitarian system relies on too few donors. Globally, the 10 largest donors provide 90% of the humanitarian funding. This is not sustainable. More countries need to step in and step up in their engagement. Sweden is, as you might know, among the top humanitarian donors. Together with the European Commission, we will host the humanit European Humanitarian Forum next March. And we look forward to discussing the main strategic challenges facing the humanitarian system today. The humanitarian system makes a difference in the lives of the most vulnerable people every day. It provides assistance to the people that are suffering the most, and it saves lives in some of the worst places across the globe. But we must ensure that 2023 is not the year that breaks the system. This is a shared responsibility. The new Swedish government uh, that took office earlier uh, this year has uh, outlined its priorities uh, for 
its development work, and I'm pleased to say that humanitarian assistance will remain a key priority for the Swedish government. We take the current alarming situation worldwide seriously, and we will continue to do more than our part. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ms. Jansa. We turn now to our final panelist. We heard again and again over the last uh, 20 minutes, half an hour or so, women and children, perhaps their voices are not heard as much as they should be. Someone said sometimes they're even ignored. And so I'm delighted that our final speaker is Ms. Inger Ashing. She's uh, Chief Executive Officer of Save the Children International. Um, a powerful voice for children in need is, of course, Save the Children. We've heard that women and children, the disabled, elderly, are particularly impacted by food insecurity. We've heard again and again that their voices need to be stronger and that organizations like your own need to listen carefully to what they say about what they actually need, how you're actually helping them, what works, what doesn't. So in your view, how do you think we could change to get better accountability? I mean, particularly to children who may not be able to express exactly what it is they need. The floor is yours, four minutes. Thank you so much. Uh, so I think first I would like just to remind everyone that half of the populated, uh, affected population is children. So this is not uh, a small group. This is half of the group that we are discussing. And of course, uh, we need to uh, pay much more attention to what children and the communities think, what they need, what they want. Uh, and as Save the Children, uh, we have in the last, over the past two years, we have actually consulted over 54,000 children globally to talk to them about what their needs are, what their experiences are. And, and thousands of, of them are in hunger hotspots like uh, Somalia, Afghanistan and South Sudan, uh, where children are facing experience, I mean, they, where they're facing astronomic levels of hunger and malnutrition. And also we have talked to many, many uh, children in conflict zones. There are a couple of things that really stands out to me when, when I look at, at the, the, the views of the children that we have spoken to. Uh, and uh, the first is that there is, there is an absolute difference between what children experience and how they experience crises and how we respond, how we design the responses, how we fund the responses. Secondly, uh, children are very much aware of, of the risks links to climate, economic hardship, conflict, and, and, and also the need for us to respond before the crisis hit. So the whole focus on anticipatory action is something that children themselves urge us to do more because they know that it works. The third thing is that we need uh, a trans transformative shift in our system design and, and implement responses to be able to be truly accountable to children and their communities. And, and I think from when we speak to children, I mean, they are not only facing a, a, a food crisis. They are not only facing a climate crisis. For them, it is a crisis affecting all parts of their lives. And I think that is something that we often fail to address when we have our humanitarian responses and also how we fund them. Uh, I was uh, earlier this year in Mozambique, in Cabo Delgado, and I was visiting an IDP camp. And I met a 14-year-old girl. She, has, she had, for the last three years, been the head of her household. She was responsible for three siblings, one of them three years old. So she, she was actually being responsible for that, that child when, when it, it was a newborn. She had nothing. They had nothing. They were totally dependent on the community around them to support them. But when I sat down and spoke to her, of course she wanted a shelter, she wanted a house, she wanted to, to be able to give her siblings proper food. But the one thing that she wanted more than everything was access to education for herself and for her siblings, because she wanted herself and her siblings to have a future. And I think that's often what we tend to forget, that for children and other parts of, of, of the communities where we work, it's not hunger, it's not education, it's all of it at the same time. Uh, and, and of course, the, our failure of, of addressing it has implications. So, when we speak, and we heard uh, many of examples uh, from, from people speaking before me that, of course, 
if, if, if children don't have access to food, their ability to, to even if they're able to go to school, <laughs> to actually get a quality education, I mean, that's truly disrupted because they cannot concentrate. It's, it's not a, possible for them to, 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 to make the most of, of, of schooling, even if they have access to it. Uh, and and um, uh, I also think that when we speak to children, one of the things that really stands out is that they care deeply about not just their own lives and, and, and their own future, but also uh, the, the situation for their whole family. They worry a lot about their, the whole family, their siblings, etc. And, and just a few words on, on, on the things uh, that we often do not uh, fund enough when we have uh, emergencies, and that is education and protect, protection. I mean, we heard about the huge funding gaps, but when we look at education and protection, that remains less than 30% funded. And this directly affects our uh, collective ability to, to deliver a response that targets the unique needs of children. Uh, and if we, need to, if we want to be more accountable to children, we need to start by recognizing that the, their rights, they have the right to be consulted and they have the right to actually participate in the decisions that affect their lives. Uh, and engaging with children themselves is essential uh, and quality programs, uh, we will have more quality programs if we do work with them and take their views into account. Uh, I, I just want to, to uh, conclude by saying, I mean, I, I was in Afghanistan a while back and, and I had the opportunity to sit down with uh, a number of, of young girls that were participating in, in our community-based schools. And we all know how dire the situation is in Afghanistan. But they too said to me, the one thing that we want you to support us with is give us access to education. So we need to have a holistic approach. We need, really need to listen to their needs because if we don't, we will fail in our accountability to them, and we will also f fail in designing and delivering quality programs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Inger, and in fact, to all our panelists. Um, it's time for the, the uh, diplomats here to have their input. We've got about <coughs> 25 minutes, maximum half an hour for input from diplomats because I want our panelists, it is supposed to be interactive, I want our panelists to be able to respond to you at the close so that we have a proper rounded discussion. Um, first on my list, these are pre-registered, the, the, the diplomats who want to speak, is the United States. I think I saw you a moment ago. Ah, there you are. Hello. You have the floor. Thank you. On behalf of the United States, I would like to extend my thanks to both OCHA for organizing today's launch and to the panelists for what has been a truly sobering and rich discussion so far. Uh, year after year, we note with added urgency the unprecedented levels of people in need of humanitarian assistance and the unprecedented amount of funding required. And this year, indeed, as need tops a staggering 50 billion, this has never been more true. But nor has the call to empower and shift decision-making to those in need and those on the front lines and best positioned to help them been more urgent or overdue. Against this backdrop, of course, we have to recognize that the environment in which humanitarian work is, humanitarian's work is increasingly dangerous and fraught with roadblocks to gain access to populations in need. And we are indebted to those who commit their lives to working in these contexts, most often in their own communities, to bring life-saving aid to millions around the world. The United States is proud to be the world's largest humanitarian donor. We remain committed to supporting robust and timely responses in 2023, but as we all know and as has been discussed, the gap between available resources and life-saving needs continues to widen. We must all give considerable attention to how we use the political, technical, and financial tools at our disposal more effectively. This includes bringing in new sources of funding and using existing funding more effectively. The international humanitarian community has made progress on coordination, for example, including around cash, but we remain far from what is truly required to achieve a more accountable, efficient, and effective humanitarian response, and one that puts people first. And I think the panel has well illuminated that this morning. In that vein, we need your help to ensure humanitarian response plans are strategic, 
focused and appropriately prioritizing those needs that can and should be covered by humanitarian access actors. But I want to emphasize the importance of ensuring that needs are carefully evaluated and prioritized, and that existing government, state, local, and community capacities, voices, agency, and needs are accounted for. We can and must put our attention toward these efforts while also supporting life-saving responses. In this respect, the focus of today's discussion and subsequent launches is particularly welcome. While we talk about putting people first, it is important to underscore the direct link between food insecurity and protection violations, as women and children are disproportionately affected and most at risk of negative coping strategies, including vulnerability to sexual exploitation and abuse. It is critical that protection is kept not only at the forefront of our response to food insecurity, but embedded across all activities. We look forward to supporting OCHA and many others in those critical lines of efforts in 2023 and beyond, and I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, United States. Just a gentle reminder, keep diplomats your, your input really within two minutes, a minute and a half, preferable. Um, Turkey, you're next. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Although I prepared a rather long uh, statement, but uh, your timely <laughs> warning, I mean, <laughs> forced me to improvise my speech. And uh, first of all, I would like to extend our heartfelt thanks uh, to Mr. Griffiths, uh, Under Secretary of uh, United Nations, as well as all uh, panelists and speakers uh, who took the floor and uh, tried to cover the important aspects of a global humanitarian situation uh, before us. And my country, fortunately or unfortunately, at the crossroads of many challenges when it comes to a humanitarian uh, uh, disasters or, or challenges, and uh, traditionally, I mean, Turkey, Turkey has been a, a perfect uh, humanitarian power, I should say, I mean, throughout history. And uh, we will continue to be in the service of humanity uh, and uh, extend our helping hand uh, to the populations, countries, uh, in need. And then, uh, of course, we acted uh, as such when we uh, host, uh, received I mean, more than uh, 4 million refugees in Turkey. Uh, and uh, that's why we are the largest refugee hosting country in the world for almost a decade. And on top of that, we are trying to help uh, civilians in the opposition-held territories of uh, Syria. And uh, I would like to remind that, I mean, uh, these cross-border uh, operations uh, should be endorsed by the UN Security Council uh, in January. And uh, all the humanitarian leaders, as uh, they have done in the past, uh, make a very strong call to all the relevant uh, uh, countries or the members of the UN Security Council to extend uh, this uh, resolution because uh, this five million people will be in desperate position and it will further incentivize the uh, irregular migration towards uh, Europe, first to Turkey, than to Europe. So, and uh, of course, we appreciate the, uh, our collaboration with UN when it comes to grain deal. And, uh, and we will continue to do our utmost uh, to keep this lifeline, I mean, to the world. Because uh, year 2022 was an uh, I don't want to call it terrible year, but uh, extremely difficult year. We are uh, facing multitude of challenges from food insecurity to energy insecurity, then civil wars, droughts, and uh, 
uh, interstate wars, uh, enough is enough. And then uh, 2023, we need to work uh, together very efficiently uh, to address the enormous challenges and to uh, keep our uh, Mother Earth uh, a bit safer place for the human beings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Next on my list is the United Kingdom, Ambassador Manley. Uh, very much to our panel this morning. It's, look, it's an extraordinarily stark and depressing picture that you have uh, all painted. And obviously we're at a critical juncture for the whole humanitarian system and we need to, we need to adapt, we need to become more people-centered, as you've all said, uh, and we need uh, to become more innovative in our funding uh, and in our, our operations. Uh, and we need to actually tackle some of the root causes of this humanitarian situation, whether that be climate change and trying to keep us within 1.5 degrees or actually resolving some of these long-running conflicts uh, which uh, drive uh, the humanitarian challenge. And let me pay tribute, uh, Martin, to you and to Rebecca Greenspan and to Tokia uh, for your work on the uh, Black Sea Grain Initiative, but also the work on Ethiopia uh, and Yemen. You'll know that we ourselves, within our own humanitarian framework, have got a kind of prioritize, protect, prevent uh, approach, prioritizing humanitarian assistance to people in greatest need, just as you were doing in this morning's overview, uh, trying to prevent uh, and anticipate future shocks and build resilience, including climate uh, resilience but also protecting those most at risk. And let me just salute all of you who I think have highlighted the gender uh, dimension of that this morning. And Natalia, thank you for being at our uh, conference on this very issue of uh, protecting sexual violence uh, in London this week, uh, which I think is an important part of all of that. And just, I mean, uh, just echo but what you've said, but also what Sheba uh, just said about the importance of listening to the voices and the aspirations of those people we are trying to, to help. We can't introduce accountability once decisions are already made. We do have to ensure that effective people's voices are right at the driver of, of our collective decision making on all of this. And we pledge our support to you, Martin, uh, as you move forward on this. And let me just finally, finally just pay tribute to the work of humanitarian workers across the globe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Manley. We now turn to Norway. So let me just start by thanking you for this, this overview of the humanitarian needs and requirements for the, for the coming year. And it's obviously a very bleak picture and your messages are clear and well received on our side. At the same time, our common focus and our dialogue with, uh, as donors with, with OCHA must be on what we, well, collectively as a humanitarian system can achieve in 2023. So together with affected states whenever that is possible. We need a clear understanding of how funding translates into results including unearmarked funding. And this must be communicated at country level and at global level to secure the continued domestic political support for high levels of humanitarian assistance and development aid. I would also like to take this opportunity to, to highlight the protection challenges that has been also clearly communicated by the panel today. But we, we know that there is no humanitarian crisis that is not also a protection crisis. So we, we welcome the fact that protection is a priority and that the centrality of protection in humanitarian response will be reflected in OCHA's new strategy. The ISC, ISSC protection policy, policy review, which was launched in Geneva two days ago, has some very clear recommendations. It reminded us that protection is not a responsibility only for agencies with specific protection mandate. Is it about reducing risks in all aspects of response, about moving beyond abstract terms and identifying which issues are the most relevant in each country context. It's about engaging local communities to discuss what can be done to make a difference. And it is about leadership. So, we expect that all negotiations on humanitarian access, that that systematically includes protection messages. 
Let me end by, by assuring the Secretary General Martin of Norway's continued strong partnership and support. And thank you for a wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Spain, your turn. Not here? Okay. Um, then we go to the European Union. Um, I know you represent 27 countries, but um, doesn't mean you get 27 <laughs> minutes. I'm sorry. Thank you. No, no worry, I'll be shorter. And, but um, thank you, uh, Ocha. Thanks, dear panelists, for your very uh, sobering uh, statements. Um, indeed, I have the honor to speak on behalf of the EU and its member states. And uh, as emergencies grow in frequency and scale, the call on the international community for solidarity and collective action to save lives and alleviate human suffering resonates stronger than ever. The explosion of humanitarian needs, as exemplified by the 2023 Global Humanitarian Overview presented today, is unprecedented in scale, severity, and suddenness. Humanitarian needs in existing crises already at an all, all time high are massively exacerbated by the food crisis. Global hunger has been on the rise since 2016, but the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine has further deteriorated global food security in 2022. The war has had its ripple effects on the global economy, most notably on the international prices of food, energy and fertilizers, as well as on supply chains. In addressing these challenges, the EU and its member states are committed to do our part. In 2022, the EU's humanitarian budget was of 2.6 billion euros, the highest ever. The EU and its member states have collectively made available 7.96 billion euros dollars for humanitarian aid in 2020 as Team Europe. We are also responding to the current food crisis in a Team Europe approach, addressing both emergency and long, longer term needs. The level of EU humanitarian funding for food assistance has been considerably upscaled, reaching 915 million euros so far in 2022. The Team Europe global food security response adopted earlier this year is uh, backed by a substantial financial commitment of around 8 billion euros for the period 2021-2024. In delivering on our commitments, the EU humanitarian action will continue to be guided by the principles of humanity, impartiality, neutrality and independence, <laughs> protection of civilians and civilian infrastructure and ensuring respect for international humanitarian law remains the foundations of the EU's response to emergencies. The EU and its member states will continue to advocate for better monitoring of IHL violations and insist on accountability in case of IHL violations, such as attacks against civilians, humanitarian and healthcare workers, or the use of starvation as a weapon of war. Furthermore, we will maintain the integrity of our actions. EU-funded humanitarian aid is gender and age sensitive and integrate disability inclusion. The EU and its member states will continue supporting efforts to prevent, mitigate and respond to sexual and gender-based violence in humanitarian crises and to apply a zero-tolerance approach to any form of sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment. Provision of comprehensive equality and humanitarian, human rights-based mental health and psychological social risk support remains our priority. We also remain fully seized with the imperative of better integration of the impact of climate change and environmental degradation into the design and delivery of our funding. The recent COP27 has underscored the fundamental challenge of climate change, which is also a major and increasing driver of humanitarian needs. In today's humanitarian landscape, the needs, for far, the needs far outpace available resources. This calls for renewed efforts to ensure better use of available resources in parallel to efforts to expand and diversify the donor base. It is imperative to step of efforts to expand and diversify the humanitarian donor base, which remains disturbingly narrow. The 10 biggest humanitarian donors account for more than 80% of humanitarian funding. It is thus essential to re reflect collectively on how to promote a better and fairer responsibility sharing, encouraging potential donors to contribute at a level consistent with their weight in the world economy. All the more so no nowadays, given the une uneven distribution of global wealth concentrating in certain regions due to the spikes in the prices of energy and energy supplies. These and other topics will be at the center of the forthcoming second edition of the European Humanitarian Forum that the Commission is co-hosting together with Sweden. 
This high-level event is scheduled to take place on 20th and 21st of March next year. will be held under the overarching theme of new global realities shaping humanitarian action together. I thank you. Thank you very much. Japan, I think you wanted to speak next. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Ocha, for organizing this uh, uh, session and uh, uh, for you know, some comprehensive briefing and uh, other panelist interventions. Uh, it is very helpful to uh, step forward on the issues uh, next year. Okay. Uh, the, global, uh, the global food crisis and the soaring energy prices have worsened the humanitarian situation in all regions. It is important to ensure that the people who suffer seriously under uh, vulnerable situations The total amount of the assistance will be approximately 1.5 billion U.S. dollars pending the approval of the, from the diet, a significant increase of, of this year of 1.1 billion U.S. dollars. Of course, our assistance covered Ukrainian considering Uh, the situation remains very difficult, and it's important to expand the donors' base as well as to seek the cooperation with the International Finance Institution and the Climate Change Fund, as the other ambassador indicated. I hope you will continue your efforts and I want to know is interesting because we have uh, tried to promote the agenda of NECTUS. We want to know the status of the pilot project and the co coordination with the relevant agency on a regular basis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next on our list, sorry about that, slightly distracted, is Germany. Thank you. Um, the message of uh, today's launch, unfortunately, is about a grim and deplorable trend that has been continuing for the last years. We face rising needs into many humanitarian crises around the globe, and there is no um, end uh, in sight. Let me underline um, three very short points. First, peace and conflict resolution are indeed essential factors for ensuring that humanitarian crisis can end or even do not start in the first place. Armed conflict is just one of many reasons for skyrocketing numbers of people in need, many of them women and children. And let me add the brutal Russian war of aggression on Ukraine is one particularly striking example the effects of this war alone on food prices are a threat to food security globally. On top of uh, conflict, the disastrous consequences of climate change and extreme weather drive humanitarian needs and will probably increase further in the coming years. We have little reason to hope that we can shrink the humanitarian financing gap anytime soon, not even if large donor countries, Germany among them, continue to increase the humanitarian spending each year. Germany is convinced that we have a strong moral obligation to step up our share of assistance the way we have done over the past years, and we call on others to do the same. Second point, for a more sustainable way forward, which truly commits to solving the multitude of crises that lay ahead, we need to improve the way development, peace, and humanitarian actors work together as part of this nexus. Thirdly, we need to jointly assess the current humanitarian architecture for necessary improvements 
There are suitable platforms for discussing humanitarian reform in place, and that is why Germany is strongly engaged in the grand bargain. We need to ensure that accountability for affected population is not just an empty phrase. Thus, it is essential that we closely involve the people in need as recipients of assistance. Let me conclude by saying all of us, donors, international organizations, recipient countries, local and international NGOs, need to step up to holding ourselves accountable to the commitments we have made, financial commitments, but especially the structural ones as well. Germany has taken on responsibility and we will remain committed financially and politically. The global community and the humanitarian system need to act collectively and we want to master the enormous challenges highlighted by the GHO. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next on our list is France. Just a gentle reminder, of diplomats, to, to stay within your time because I am determined that our panelists get to have the final word and um, we're running a bit over time. France? Thank you very much. Assistant Secretary General, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, France, of course, aligns itself with the statement by the EU. I would just like to add a few things in my national capacity, if I may. As you underscored, the impacts of climate change and conflicts on populations are absolutely devastating, especially as regards women and children. Their suffering must compel us to action. Russia's assault against Ukraine is creating humanitarian threats for the world. We support the Safe Crops Initiative and the European Solidarity Corridors, and we have launched a 20 million euro support for the World Food Programme for shipping Ukrainian grain to Somalia and Sudan. This is in the context of the Grain from Ukraine initiative. France stands by Ukraine and its neighboring countries with a humanitarian um, aid amounting to 200 million euros in 2022, plus some made for Moldova. We also have a national conference for Ukraine, which will be taking place in Paris on the 13th of December. Support for Ukraine is not by any means deviating our attention from other crises, and we stand by Sahel and the Middle East as well. The threats facing the humanitarian system are multiple. We need to step up financing and we need to optimize the delivery of aid and coordination between the different uh, peace and humanitarian actors. We need to anticipate so as to better respond. We need to place the voices of the populations most affected at the center of our responses. We need to step up protection for humanitarian workers and promote the respect of international humanitarian law. France will continue to work along your efforts to support this. Thank you. Thank you very much. We turn to the Netherlands now. Yes, thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Griffith and dear panelists. Um, of course, the Netherlands fully aligns itself with the uh, EU position. Um, I, we must say that uh, you've presented us a very gloomy... Thank you and through you the thousands of humanitarian workers worldwide uh, who do their work every day under very difficult circumstances and even sometimes at the peril of their own lives. I'd also like to underline that uh, with our focus on exploding needs, we sometimes forget that the system that OCHA coordinates saves millions of people every day. Our contribution will be mostly on earmarked funding. And just let me add the voice to the panelists and also some of the other speakers who are calling for on earmarked funding because we believe that the humanitarian system and the involvement of local actors and voices is best placed to prioritize the most pressing needs. exponentially, we conclude that the solution is more funding. But we should not forget that most crises, as my German colleague has said, are man-made, increasingly as a result of climate change, but also, and most, uh, most importantly, armed conflict is still the number one driver of humanitarian needs. The entire world, especially in terms of 
food security, which is compounded by the economic crisis. What we really need then is reduction of needs by preventing and ending conflicts, by upholding the norms that safeguard humanity, and by improving people's lives through sustainable development. It's a responsibility that's on the humanitarian sector, but also, as the uh, moderator says, on us, the diplomats. Promote local capacity and empowerment, especially of women and youth, and to focus on durable solutions and to deliver mental health. to support principled humanitarian action, adherence to and promotion of international humanitarian law, and to work, with a, to work for a more transparent, accountable, and effective system that saves lives and reduces suffering in the short term. Thank you. Thank you very much. We turn now to our last two speakers, the Philippines first and then Switzerland. Thank you, Chair. We wish to thank UN OCHA for organizing this briefing. UN OCHA's agenda is in line for, with the Philippines' humanitarian priorities, including advocating for rights and welfare of people in vulnerable situations, including women and children, indigenous peoples, and persons with disabilities. We value UN OCHA's work on climate and disaster displacement in addressing sexual and gender-based violence. We also acknowledge efforts to deliver humanitarian assistance and protection. In it, it is in this regard that the Philippines has responded to several of UN OCHA's emergency appeals, including those for Yemen and Ukraine, among others. It is our advocacy to expand the UN's base of financial support beyond traditional donors and tap the formidable potential of middle-income and developing countries, part of our aspiration for global bur burden and responsibility sharing. We look forward to partnering with UN OCHA in this regard. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Switzerland, you have the, the final diplomatic word. Thank you, Chair. Excellencies, uh, it's a great honor to join you today once again, we are coming to the end of a year that has shaken up the world. Crises we face are characterized by their complexity, duration, and impact. This reminds us that we need to be more efficient, innovative, anticipative, and better coordinated. We echo the crucial need to consider fully people we work for, being more inclusive, more accountable through meaningful and actors. It is exactly for this reason that Switzerland co-led the Grand Bargain Caucus on the role of intermediaries. Concrete actions are needed to advance this agenda, which involve equitable partnerships with local national actor actors. As the preferred mode of delivery, We must now empower local and national actors to drive and deliver principled humanitarian responses in their communities. Switzerland is committed to doing its part in supporting new ways of working. Uh, the challenges highlighted in the GHO further confirm the, the importance of adopting a comprehensive approach, development, cooperation, peace policy. To conclude, let me thank Martin Griffiths and his team, who contributed to the Global Humanitarian Overview, um, an essential compass to guide humanitarian support and action. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the uh, diplomatic input there. We're going to go to a very quick round of summing up from our panelists who are here in the room, um, and then we'll give the final word to Martin Griffiths. Um, Minister, I will start with you. We heard an awful lot about accountability and innovation and so on from the diplomats. Just one minute, quick summing up from you. What would be the key change you would like to see in 2023? Merci. Thank you. As I said earlier, for 2023, we would like to 
continue to have coordination and consultation between government actors as well as others. And there needs to be a significant link between NGOs and agencies as well as the government. That is why we created the sectorial coordination. This is a place of exchange and consultation. We want to pursue this and within this intersectoral coordination we need to find the best way of working in order to save lives. Then we have the integration of local NGOs in the response provided and here I would like to thank Mr. Griffiths and Mr. Vedis, who is here with me. The law governing the function of NGOs means that there is 25% of funding allocated to local NGOs. This wasn't done in the past, but uh, for a year now, this year, we have that funding. I think we're going to move towards 12%. Uh, we're at 4%, and we're going to move towards 12%. This is also a way of ensuring that the funding provided by donors really reaches the population. This will lead to resilience and development because you will be ensured that you have invested in the right places and that your investment is visible. I'd also like to request flexibility, as I said, with respect to funding, to ensure that we can move towards a nexus. We talk about a nexus, but on the ground we don't see this nexus. So we do need this flexibility. This will enable us to create a link between nexus, peace and development, uh, land and development. That's what I wanted to say. This is the desire and will of the government. I'd also like to take this opportunity to extend my thanks to all donors. Thank you for keeping the Central African Republic on your agendas. Thank you also to other countries. That is why we are here. We're here to tackle global needs, and I see that you are very attentive to that, and may God bless you. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Madame Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Minister. One minute. Yes, well, thanks very much. I just want to also appreciate the refugee hosting countries and also the IDP welcoming communities and thank you so much for acknowledging the work of the humanitarian worker who's running towards the flame. For women, they've told us over and over what they want peace, what they want is justice. I'd also like to say that that's a big part of accountability. For me, disaggregated data is important. That's how we know who's being left behind, who's vulnerable, and also that's how we come to the accountability of the results-based uh, information and also innovation and ever more efficiency. So disaggregated data, confidentiality, respected, anonymous where required is going to be very important. Next year, what I want to uh, see <coughs> is that the call for the shift to prevention, to preparation, to prediction becomes stronger. And I, too, want local women and young people especially to be directly involved. For UNFPA, as you've heard, we're already at 38 percent localization, but everyone can do better and that trend will continue. And then I want to emphasize that in a place like Afghanistan, where UNFPA has established community listening initiatives, that's part of paving the pathway to peace. And we really do have to stop manufacturing the type of crisis and conflict, and Martin, of course, is, is uh, very uh, uh, galvanized and seized by that. As UNFPA leads in the gender-based violence area of responsibility, we have to respect women, bodily autonomy, and integrity. The trend towards sexualized violence and conflict has to end, and everyone has to lift their voice, women, girls, people of different gender uh, identity, and people with disabilities. This is who was vulnerable, and we have to look at the data and say that. And uh, I would also like to appreciate the fact that, you know, even in a place like Syria, which must not be forgotten, we can adapt, we can implement, and what we really need to do is work across that humanitarian development and peace nexus, if you will, putting uh, women and girls at the center. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Inger, before I come to you, wonders of uh, uh, modern technology, we can actually hear from uh, Mimidu Achakpa 
in Nigeria, and we, you were there, I think, Mimi Do. Will you have one minute, your reaction, your summing up, your, your key wish for next year? Um, thank you very much once again. Um, for us, we want to see commitments to funding local actors upheld, including a significant increase in direct, flexible funding to women-led organizations, and we want a seat at the table. Thank you. Short and sweet and very much to the point, a seat at the table. Inger? Uh, thank you so much. So, um, there's three things that I want to highlight, and, and I think first I want to say that, yes, of course, uh, I want to thank you, uh, all, all the donors in the room, for, for everything that you do in response to the humanitarian crises that we see around the world. But we need you. People need you to step up even more. Uh, and and uh, because of the, the gaps and everything we heard Martin uh, start the, this, this uh, day uh, telling us. But there's, so there's a need to step up, but there's also a need to do things differently. Uh, and um, and I, I think one thing that I want to say that I didn't say before and, and is, is I, I think there's so much uh, need for us to think differently on how we fund things. So this, I mean, flexible funding is key. It gives uh, the affected uh, populations uh, an opportunity to, it, it gives us an opportunity to adapt our responses to the needs on the ground. And I think that is very closely linked to accountability. So the more flexible funding, the more funding adapted to the needs of the people that we are there to support and serve, the, the, the more accountable, accountable we are to them. So that's the first thing, respond differently and, and have flexible funding. Um, anticipatory action, we've been talking about it throughout the, this, this uh, morning and, and to, to act before the crisis hit uh, and, and really to think about how we can scale that up in the coming year, I think will be critical. My, my final point is, is I end where Mimidu ended, and that is for this to be truly uh, effective and sustainable, we really need to ensure that we are all uh, supporting local uh, and community-based organizations. They are often the ones that respond the first. They know the best what is needed. So I, 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 I commit to, in my own organization, continue to partner with local and national organizations. We do that already, but I commit to do that even more. And, and we need all of you to commit to do the same. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I give the final word to Martin Griffiths, I'd just like to thank all of the guests, all of the input, especially all of our panelists. For me, it was a pleasure to be here. I really learned a lot. Um, next year is going to be a very challenging year. We hope, as Martin has said already, it's one of solidarity. Um, you can feel some of that here in the room, which is at least a good start. Martin Griffiths, final words to you. Thanks a lot, Imogen. Thanks for doing this. Thanks to everyone. Thanks particularly, obviously, to the panel. And thank you, as many have said, and as Dani just said, to the humanitarian workers that we're here to honor today. Accountability, I think three things, Imogen, and then I'll stop. Number one, this is not in order of priority. Number one, accountability for climate promises to those impacted by climate damage. Let's get that money out of the door to the people who need it. Quickly, accountability, tangibly and publicly. Number two, accountability to gender gender priorities, youth priorities, we've heard a lot. Let's make the issue of protection and the empowerment of those groups a chasse garde, a preserve within our efforts to raise money and finance and promote those activities. And number three, finally, and you will have heard it from all of us, including from many diplomats, and it's hugely, hugely welcome, empowerment, accountability to communities. Let's make the conversation with those communities a real one, not a consumer satisfaction survey, a genuine discussion to allow them to take control of our lives. Let us try the best we can to get them in that driving seat. Let's make 2023 a year when we flipped that relationship to where it needs to be, to where they tell us what they need, how they need it, and allow us to serve them better. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.